um, using citizen science uh, to measure water quality across the state. But I'm going to take a couple steps back from talking about citizen science once I figure out how to, oh, I'll just use this. There we go. To um, talk a little bit more about some bigger questions that I'm interested in with my research program, which is really how can we link water quality and health? Um, so one um, area that I'm focused on is pediatric cancers. And so we know that um, environmental contaminants, exposure to environmental contaminants is a risk factor, a suspected risk factor for development of pediatric cancers. Um, we actually also know that Nebraska has a high incidence of certain types of pediatric cancers um, across the U.S. Um, we rank about seventh in incidence of pediatric cancer, and you wouldn't think that for Nebraska. A lot of these other states above us are in the northeast and very industrial um, areas or regions, and then there's Nebraska. So you have to say what's going on here that might lead to that high incidence, and also um, with with respect to certain types of cancer, including uh, pediatric brain tumors, Nebraska actually ranks um, second in the nation. Um, there's been studies showing the connection between agrochemicals and health. So, let's see, am I pointing? Are you guys seeing my point? Nope. So this figure here, for example, um, just shows a relationship between birth defects, which is the dotted, the dots on that line and atrazine concentration in surface water. And this was an association that was developed um, across about 30 years of data across the entire US, showing that peaks um, in the um, day of the last menstrual period for women that gave birth to children with birth defects occur when we see this peak of atrazine occurring in our surface water. So there's certainly connections between our environment and health. Um, a more recent paper that actually just came out last year also is looking at the relationship um, not just with specific water contaminations, but just watersheds in general. So again, I'm also very interested in looking at questions about um, how can we examine health um, by watershed or, or in, within watersheds. So this paper um, that came out Last year was looking at the different factors, environmental factors, including precipitation and climate, um, and relating those to cancer um, incidence rates across the U.S., and actually found that cold climate and high precipitation areas had higher um, cancer incidence. And so it was very interesting because in a discussion, the authors actually hypothesized, they don't know why this was, but they hypothesized that it's due to um, you know, biogenic sources that affect, affect carcinogenesis, and they specifically call out nitrate. So um, a clearly mediated uh, conversion from ammonia to nitrate, and then that nitrate can convert to um, nitrous acid, which is volatile and, and carcinogenic, or conversion of ingested nitrates um, in vivo to uh, and nitroso compounds. So again, this is just an interesting result, though, that there are studies that show that there are environmental factors that we would think about being associated with watersheds or across different ge geographies that have um, relationship to, to health outcomes. And then finally, um, one other paper from a couple years ago just showing that this is really an underexplored area. So this was a commentary published in the Lancet Planetary Health, just showing, and I think this is the key quotation here, few studies connect watersheds with public health. Um, and a review from 10 years of the literature found only about 3.5% of those papers focused on um, human health and watershed management. So I think this is just kind of a call to say this is a really understudied and important area for us to focus on. So this is something that we've been focusing on, and I promise I'm getting to citizen science here in just a little bit. Um, but a few years ago, we published a study looking at how we could map adverse health outcomes using watershed boundaries. So health data is often given 
in terms of um, census tract or, or zip codes. And so you, there, you have to go through a process to convert that to something that you can plot in terms of a, a watershed. And so we went through a process and developed maps for Nebraska. Uh, this map, A, panel A, shows the incidence of birth defects per 100,000 people uh, for, for Huck 8 watersheds across the state. And as these colors get darker, you see higher incidence of, of birth defects. Um, and this plot, panel B, is, is thyroid cancers. Again, um, incidence per 100,000 people. And so the takeaway message here is A, that yes, you can plot health data um, using watershed boundaries, although it's not an extremely straightforward thing to do, it can be done. And the other thing to point out is that there are geographic differences, right? So we don't see the same pattern um, between these two um, diseases across the state. And also we certain, certainly see areas of the state where we have much higher incidence for certain types of, um, of diseases. So this really led to our interest in water quality and how water quality might be one of the factors that's influencing uh, the incidence of disease across the state, and again, specifically with a focus on pediatric cancer. So these are just a couple of maps. This first one is pediatric cancer cases. So each one of these black dots uh, corresponds to, oopsie, now I know how to move the slides with, with my mouse, um, corresponds to a, a case of pediatric cancer. Um, and this was over a, about a 30 year period. And the background uh, watersheds sh show the uh, surface water average or mean surface water concentration of atrazine, um, where you know the red and orange are the highest levels of atrazine in surface water. So we're interested in trying to look at these kind of relationships. Um, and we can also make a similar map with atrazine and pediatric cancer and groundwater but um, we wanted to go further than just, just plotting these two things together. Um, some things that are interesting just by looking at these plots, you can see obviously, you know, without really tracing it, I feel like even with the pediatric, you can kind of follow this line of pediatric cancer cases along the plot. That could be just due to the fact that that's where people are living, or it potentially could be due to some aspect of exposure. Um, and we also see kind of higher than average incidence of pediatric cancer in uh, the northeastern part of the state of Nebraska, which as we know is an area where we're focused, where the university is focused on looking at uh, groundwater management and, and management of nitrates. But we wanted to go further. We wanted to look at statistical or mathematical correlations between these two data sets. Um, so we had to, you know, delve into the water quality data. And what we find is that even though we do have a lot of information on water quality, um, there are some limitations, especially when we want to look at data over long time periods, 30 year periods, so that we can use all of that health data. Um, and what we find is that there is limited data, both spatially and temporally. So this is just a map um, produced by um, NDE, just showing um, mean nitrate concentration for townships across the state. And you see all of these gray areas are actually areas where there's not water quality information uh, available. So we certainly have you know, areas of the state with that data. And then this time series plot on the other side of the slide just shows for a particular watershed, um, a time course for atrazine measurements. Um, and you see again, oops, big gaps, right? So we don't always, if we want to look at um, incidence of um, pediatric cancer, especially when you have a 18 or 19 year um, latency period in which those cancers can develop, when you have these large gaps in our water quality record, that can be really problematic for trying to link and look for, you know, connections between, between those two types of data. So that brings us to citizen science. So one of the techniques that we want to use and are using um, to fill in some of these gaps, and obviously we can't try and travel back into the past, but we can certainly design monitoring strategies to help us use this data going forward um, is citizen science. So we're interested both in establishing monitoring networks in areas with elevated pediatric cancer incidence, but we're also very interested in engaging the community and collecting 
water quality data from their homes or from their home communities. Um, and that really is citizen science. Sometimes you'll hear citizen science called crowdsourced data collection or crowdsourced science. Um, and I think the benefits of citizen science are twofold. One is it's an excellent educational tool. And I think that's a lot of times where the use of citizen science grows from being a, a way that you can engage the public in outreach. Um, we want to take that step further and, and we're not alone. A lot of people using, using citizen science are using it to um, inform scientific decisions or to, to conduct their own science. And so we really have two hypotheses around citizen science. One is that citizen science data, specifically the water quality data we can collect from citizen scientists is accurate. Um, so it's scientifically accurate and we can use it to either form or test scientific hypotheses. So it goes beyond just educating people about water quality. It's actually useful information that we can make um, informed decisions on. And then our second hypothesis is that citizen science allows us to test um, over very large spatial or temporal scales that otherwise might really be very infeasible to sample. So for those of you that do water sampling, as you know, it's expensive, right? both in terms of time and resources. Um, and to cover the state or to cover, you know, an entire watershed, uh, for you know years and years and years is it's just basically an expensive proposition so we can use citizen scientists to help us with some of that sampling so i really think about citizen science as a different kind of water sampling tool um, it certainly doesn't give you exactly the same data that you would get from an analytical lab it's never going to replace uh, dan <laughs> in the analytical lab but it's a different tool that can be appropriate at certain uh, times and to help you answer certain questions so in order to test our hypotheses, we first needed to test to answer our question, can citizen scientists accurately measure water quality? Um, because this was not something that had been demonstrated previously. And this is the first question that you get when you talk to people or write a grant saying, I'm gonna collect all of this data using citizen scientists. And the first response is, well, that is not gonna be accurate, right? So you, yes, people can go out, they can collect water samples, uh, they could test something, but how do you know that the answer that they're getting is actually correct? And so that's what we set out first to do. And so we designed um, a study where we wanted to look at experience level. So the font here, I apologize if it's too small, but we divided our, we conducted focus groups with different individuals, our citizen scientists, and divided them by experience level. So we were interested in uh, people that had never been in a lab, never touched any kind of water quality or laboratory testing equipment before. Those were our inexperienced users. We had a center um, group of experienced users where maybe they'd taken a lab class or maybe they had done some kind of um, testing previously, but they, but they weren't experts. And then we had our expert group, which really came largely from um, a, uh, the Nebraska um, public Health Association um, members. So these were people that work routinely in labs, or people that have a lot of experience with laboratory testing. Um, and so what we did was we gave them either um, samples that we had spiked with atrazine, uh, nitrate, and phosphate at different levels. We asked them to test those um, samples in focus groups. And then we also went out and collected samples from Elmwood Creek in Omaha and took those field samples back and again asked the citizen scientists to test them. And then we also um, analyzed the samples using analytical techniques so we knew the concentration um, of our target analytes in all of the samples. So how accurate could our citizen scientists be? So how we ultimately decided to plot our data was use something um, called a receiver operating curve, which plots sensitivity uh, versus specificity. So that's basically sensitivities, the um, percentage or rate of tr uh, true positives and false positives is the specificity. 
So this is a, a way that you can plot accuracy of different tests. And what you're looking for, for a test to be 100% accurate, the data would basically come up straight on this um, y-axis up to 100%, right? And then you'd have a straight line over. So that would be 100% accurate um, test. And so you can measure the area under the curves. Um, and again, the area under that curve would be equal to one. That's a perfectly accurate test. And this line right here is basically your 50-50 line where your rate of uh, true positives is equal to your rate of false positives, and that's going to be basically like a coin toss, right? So um, sometimes I give this presentation to non-technical audiences. On my sensitivity line, I have this pregnant woman being bold, you're pregnant, right? That's a true positive. And on my false positive line, I have this poor gentleman um, being told, you're pregnant, right? So that's definitely untrue. So here's data, and I'm just going to show one snapshot, but the data that we had for our nitrate tests. So again, we divided these by our experience levels, and what you'll see is that our expert testers were really pretty spot on um, in their accuracy. Their, the area under that curve was 0.92, so 92% of the time they were correct. Our experienced testers uh, were not too far off the mark. They were accurate about 80% of the time. And then, interestingly, our inexperienced testers were actually less accurate than a coin toss. They were only accurate 35% um, of the time. And so, there's two takeaways from this data. One is that how someone gets from this group to this group or this group is training and practice, right? So, you can move people um, in terms of their accuracy from here to up here by training them with the use of the tool and by having them use the tool repeatedly. So we felt that was really good. That um, told us that we could um, count on data from our trained volunteers to be accurate. Um, the other thing with what we think was going on with this, how they were actually, our inexperienced testers were sometimes less, sometimes less accurate, was what we did was we gave them our instructions that we had that were the same for everyone. We handed them a sample and we said, test this for nitrate. And what we think happened here is that our inexperienced testers and many of the samples, including our field samples, there wasn't nitrate present. So if you ask someone to test for something in water, they're less, they don't want to report that the answer is zero. So I think they're biased toward um, reporting false positives. Um, and Because if you give someone a test and say, test this sample for nitrate, they want to tell you that there's some amount of nitrate present in the sample. Um, so we felt good about this, and so we felt like this helped us um, feel more confident that our citizen science testers could be accurate, and then I will also say in subsequent years of our citizen science program, we've gone out and done some spot checking. So people collect samples, we go back um, and ask to collect a second sample that we'll take to an analytical lab, and this is backed up. We're, we feel like we're getting accurate data from our citizen scientists. So um, we did that testing in 2017, and in 2018, we were ready to start our program. And initially, our goal was really modest. We just wanted to see, could we do this? <laughs> could we run a citizen science program that um, was sustainable and also um, kept track and, and had good volunteer communication and um, good communication with the people who are testing. So that's a very, very important part of citizen science is making sure that you're communicating well and managing your volunteers really well. So our goal was very modest. The very first time we wanted to recruit 100 people um, to measure nitrate, we also measured, it gave them two test strips, so a nitrate nitrite strip and then also phosphate test strip. And our first goal was just to try to do this in eastern Nebraska. And we were interested in private uh, drinking water wells and also interested in surface water quality. Um, ultimately, and we didn't really have a real strong recruitment strategy at the beginning, so we set up this website, which is still up. And at the end, I'm going to tell you, you can sign up for 2020. Um, but go.unl.eu, WQCS, Water Quality Citizen Science, that's our project website. You can go, you can sign up. 
And so what would happen is people would come here, they would sign up, and then when the, we had two, uh, three testing periods in 2018, when that testing period would roll around, we'd send out our kits in the mail, you'd get your kit, you'd do your sampling, and send us back the results. So ultimately, uh, we ended up recruiting 190 individuals who measured almost 200 water, surf water uh, samples and about 140 groundwater samples, and we did some training in, in person. So if we had school groups or other larger groups where we could go and do an in-person training with how to use the tools, we did that. Otherwise, we have YouTube videos that our website links to where you can watch them and in a couple minutes I'll learn how to use these tools. And the tools are definitely not rocket science or colorimetric um, hawk test strips for those of you that might be familiar with that. But we're basically asking people to dip a strip in water, um, count or time themselves for a minute, and then match the color to a chart. So first thing that's really critical when you're thinking about citizen science, and I'll show you some of our water quality results, but first I want to show you our volunteer results, because I think this is one of the most critical pieces. You have to spend a lot of time on recruitment and also management of your volunteers. Um, so nothing frustrates me more when I read about people doing citizen science and they're like, we're going to do this and that and that, and they have no plan for how they're going to manage their volunteers, how they're going to communicate, and then what we really need, honestly, is a coordinator um, to manage this. And it, it can be a student, but it's sometimes better if you have a lot of continuity in the program. So we did very minimal recruitment in 2018. We did, we got confident, more confident in 2019 that we wanted to expand the program. So we did a variety of recruitment strategies to, to um, get participants to in our program. And so I just wanted to go through what some of those were. Um, we did kind of a blitz on social media on World Water Day, um, we always went back to our previous citizen scientists and asked them if they were willing to test again and get a lot of repeat um, participants in the program, I think, because it's really easy. It takes about a minute to do this. Um, we've, we've held events with Conservation Nebraska, which is a um, AmeriCorps program. Um, we went out to Homestead for NET, had a um, citizen science fair at Homestead National Monument. Uh, we tabled at different conferences, including the Water for Food Conference. And then we were really fortunate in the later part of summer um, that we were able to do some media um, pieces, including through UNL, Market Journal, and then some other uh, radio interviews. And this is our recruitment and volunteer data. So the blue line, uh, which is pretty much tracked under the orange line, is our uh, number of citizen scientists. And then the gray and orange lines are our number of samples that they collected. And so you can see we started uh, the very first time with a little over 50 volunteers, and we're now up to almost 250 um, citizen scientists testing water during our testing periods. And I would say many of these are, are the same people, right? So that's something that we're still tracking is how many repeat um, participants we have, but it seems like we have a fairly good number that continue to come back and, and do this testing. So now getting into a little bit of the data, here's one representation of the data, and this is our groundwater data um, in Nebraska. So a couple of things about this. First, we did ask people to test upstream of their, any kind of home sampling or home treatment that they might have. So these concentrations don't necessarily represent concentrations that people are drinking. These are representative of, of groundwater concentrations in the area. And each one of these dots represents a a uh, citizen scientist generated data point. The, the red and dark red um, are samples that measured over the drinking water standard of 10 parts per million, and those are slightly larger dots. Um, but the yellow is between two, um, two and five, and then the green dots are below two parts per million. So we're definitely interested both in 10 milligrams per liter um, which is this zone here, but also there have been papers showing health impacts at concentrations as low as two parts per million. So really, you know, the orange, red, and yellow areas are, area, are concentrations that may have um, health concerns. So this is just showing, this bar shows um, the total 
This is 2018, and then these are our two sampling periods in 2019. And so we saw a couple of interesting things. First of all, um, I think we saw an impact potentially of the flooding that occurred. Um, and so you can see in 2018, we had about a little over half of the well water samples had nitrate below uh, two parts per million. We come up to spring of 2019, which we did in May of 2019. So after uh, the flood that had dropped to just a little bit below 30, I'm sorry, a little above 30 percent of the wells. And I think this was really interesting. We weren't necessarily going out to look at the effect of flooding on groundwater quality, but I think potentially that we were seeing that. And then we see a little bit of a rebound of that back by the summer. You can't necessarily say that it is flooding, but it does make sense to me if you have nitrate sitting in the soil or sitting in the veto zone and you have that flood water, you know, pushing it down deeper into the groundwater. Um, you know, that seems like a plausible hypothesis for what might be happening there. Um, another interesting data point is just in terms of the percentage of samples at or exceeding the drinking water standard. So when we started, we had, you know, smaller numbers. So it was a fairly high percentage, 30%. Um, but the percentage continues to drop, and our total is about 20% um, of our samples exceeding drinking water standard, which I think is fairly consistent with data reported um, from state entities. So again, this just gives us the confidence that, that what we're seeing from citizen scientists um, has some validity. In terms of nitrate concentration in surface water, again, uh, each one of these dots is an individual citizen scientist. And so in terms of um, the total number between 2018 and 19, a little over 40% of our surface water samples were below two parts per million. Um, and then we've seen increasing concentrations or increasing frequency of samples exceeding two parts per million um, from 2018 to the spring and the summer of 2019. And there have been in terms of phosphate in surface water, um, we see less phosphate, which we would expect, um, obviously, because it's largely soil associated. Um, but we did see an increase um, in the frequency of um, the presence of phosphate at this is, now is at five parts per million. And again, this potentially. Um, could be flooding induced or not, it's hard to say, but certainly when you have soil, you know, associated phosphate carried by flood water into the surface water, it's potential for us to see higher phosphate um, present in surface water. So what can we learn from citizen science? So I think a couple of things that we learned. Um, first, you know, citizen science actually gives us access to maybe certain samples that we may not otherwise be able to test. So it would be difficult for us as researchers or state agencies to go into individuals' homes to test water quality, even though we ask people to test upgrading of their um, in-home treatment, we were still able to access water quality from um, people's private wells. And we found about 20% of those wells were exceeding um, the nitrate drinking water standard of 10 parts per million. Um, and we saw that about half of the wells had nitrate concentrations greater than two parts per million, which again, there's evidence that certain groups, including children, can have um, health consequences if they're exposed to nitrate over two parts per million. So this is definitely an issue. We know Nebraska has a lot of nitrate, um, but this is data showing um, what the, the nitrate levels are in, in private wells. Um, obviously, many of these homes have treatment in place, um, but that's something I think that we need to be aware of that we, um, you know, when we see this data from, from people's home wells, that we make sure we ha are giving them good information about how they can remove this nitrate prior to drinking or using the water. And potentially we saw the impact of flooding in 2019 on water quality, where we saw increased nitrate in groundwater and decreased nitrate in surface water. Again, that decrease in surface water potentially could be due to dilution um, from that huge volume of water that was being um, carried in our surface water bodies. And we also asked in 2019 in the spring, um, we added a question to our uh, survey asking 
if people's wells were impacted by the flooding and about 8% of there were people who responded said that yes, their wells were impacted by flooding in spring of 19. So going into the future, um, we're recruiting for spring 2020. If you're interested in signing up to be a tester, you can go to our website, go to unl.edu slash WQCS. Uh, we're gonna test in May and September of 2020. So we usually do a spring and a uh, summer monitoring period. We tried in um, 2018, as you saw, to do a fall monitoring period, but we saw a really big drop off in participation. And this was basically happening in October, November, and I think it was just too cold. It just, people just didn't want to go out and um, you know, collect their samples, and I totally respect that. So we just decided to drop that fall sampling going forward because it wasn't, um, it wasn't being very responsive to what people wanted to do. And then we've seen, you know, continued increase with the spring and summer since then. Um, so we're going to stick with spring and summer going forward. Um, as we continue to monitor, we're going to be able to build up a data set to give us information about surface water quality over time. Right, so right now we're kind of aggregating our information, but as we continue this project out into the future, um, we'll be able to look at changes um, with time. Um, we were also able to collect water from about 45 counties in Nebraska, so we're also very interested in expanding um, to central and, and western Nebraska as well. Um, and so that again allows us to measure water quality over larger um, spatial scales than otherwise it might be easy for us to get out to do. Um, we're very interested, so wrapping back to the beginning, we want to combine our citizen science data with other sources of monitoring data to add um, to those water quality records <clears throat> so that we can correlate water quality and adverse health outcomes. And we're doing that, we're starting in selected watersheds where we have high incidence of pediatric cancer and also high um, elevated water quality. And then something that really came out of the um, spring 2019, we got a lot of calls for people wanting to know if we could help them um, test if their well was impacted by flood water. Because um, we're testing for, for nutrients, it's not um, you know, an acute health concern, it's more of a chronic health concern. So uh, we're looking at whether or not we can add an E. coli coliform test to our um, water quality kit so that something that does give people um, more direct information about acute health concerns. Um, and so we're working with some high school students in Omaha actually to test some different um, home testing kits and see how we could potentially add that into, into the program. So I'll just acknowledge um, a bunch of collaborators over the past three years, including uh, John Alley and Jody Sangster, who are both postdocs in my lab. Um, my collaborator, Alan Kowak, who's currently the director of the uh, Water Center at the University of Idaho. Um, former students, whose master's thesis was the focus group testing. Um, Graham Christensen, who is a, has been one of our community partners for citizen science recruitment. Um, colleagues at UNMC and UNO. And um, a shout out to the Worry program because we had a Worry scholar also work on work on this program, and then our funding sources. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hi, thanks for your presentation. It was great. Thank you. Um, so, walking back to your discussion on people managing citizen scientists. Do you have any tips or experiences that really helped you to improve your ability to manage your citizen scientists? Yeah, I think, yes. I think that's a really good question. That's, I think, um, probably one of the biggest things we've learned <laughs> and maybe learned what we did wrong to start with. Um, so to start with, we were not as careful of keeping track of our volunteers. And we had some partners, which was great. They wanted to go out and just hand out test kits, um, which was not bad, especially if you have a goal of collecting a lot of data. But we also wanted to track our participation rates. We wanted to track you know, persistence in the program with time. Um, so that was something that we couldn't do very carefully from the start, but we kind of rebooted. So just thinking about what some of those metrics are, if you want to report on your citizens scientist program, 
thinking about what those metrics are, how you want to report out, how your volunteers are participating is one piece of advice. And then the other is just having, you know, they, they call, um, you know, we at the university, we don't really answer our phones, right? And we don't have, <laughs> some people don't even have phones. Um, but a lot of people call. They want to call and talk to you on the phone. So being responsive to their phone calls is critical. Um, also, I didn't get into this a lot, but we started um, initially with a paper form because we had some initial feedback that people didn't want to use a website to return their data. And what they wanted to do was mail in the data, just you know, circle their answers and we'd send them a post this page envelope so they could send that back to us. Um, and we still do that. Now we also have the option of them entering their data on a website. So I would also say, you know, serving your participants and um, finding out how they want to participate, how they want to return their data. Um, we still have some that, that don't really, you know, care to see other people's data, um, but others are very interested in seeing their data to point with everyone else's. Um, and I think that that's the other thing with managing volunteers is also, so in this program, they get their data back immediately because they test their own sample, but they want contacts. They want to see how their data a lot of times fits in to the bigger picture. So giving them responsive feedback, you know, not just saying thank you and never um, sending back out what all the data was or sending out, back out what summary of the results were. So that's a really important part, I think, is to make sure that you're closing that loop and giving them back information um, that they could then use or learn from. Thanks. So what kind of QAQC exercises do you do at the, on the back end? Or is it necessary to have any? So um, we're not doing a lot of Q, data QAQC because the program is really, they, they, we train them up front, we send them their test kits, um, hopefully they watch our videos, and they measure their sample and send us the data. But we have gone out in both of the past years and done spot checking. So we've gone out to, um, we've asked people if you're willing to let us come out and collect another sample, especially for the well water samples where the quality shouldn't change. You know, we do this over just a period of weeks um, from when they send us their data. And then we analyze those samples to see um, how we're, you know, how comparable they are, and we're finding them to be pretty comparable. So I think that's a good piece of data. And then, you know, we did a lot of the focus group testing up front, and that, I think, also um, gave us some confidence, but I think it is something we need to think about, and you definitely need to think about what, um, what you can use the data for. I think you can use it to ask, uh, to form hypotheses, to ask certain types of scientific questions, but you, it's never going to be or replace analytical data. Could you um, explain the actual sampling itself? Is it a single time and mm -hmm. uh, geographic spot? Test? Yep. Is yeah, that's repeated? a great question. How does that work? Yep. So, for example, here, um, what we did was, and this is just all of our data aggregated together, so we could represent it different ways. Um, but in each of these, each of these periods, we had a testing program in spring eighteen, summer eighteen. These would be a three-week period. So we would recruit volunteers, communicate with them and say, you know, our spring window is from this day to this day. So they would have their test kits in advance. They would go out any day, time, um, during that window, make their measurement, and then send the data back to us. So it is a aggregate, it's a, it's a one, each one of these dots is one location and one snapshot well, they're aggregated here, but it's one location, one point in time. So we do have some people that test repeatedly the same places. Um, and as we build up our network of volunteers, we can look at that. We've also done other citizen science programs where we actually have asked people to go back to the same spot, like over six weeks or eight weeks, and test repeatedly every week on the same day at roughly the same time. So you definitely can design programs to do different things. Um, it's just kind of how you communicate with your citizen scientists. 
This one, I think part of what has made it successful is how easy it is because we're not saying it has to be this day. It can be any time in this window. You have your test kit ahead of time. You just go out and do it and then either log onto our phone app, website, or throw the thing in the mail and we give you a stamp, you know, so. But yeah, I think that's, it's, a, it's both a limitation and it can be a benefit. You can um, ask people to do different things. You just have to kind of train them up and tell them that's the expectation. Um, another thing I will say too is there are what we call like super citizen scientists, or like super testers. So there are people that do a lot of testing. They recruit other people to test. So just also in terms of like the question about volunteer management, I think part of that is finding who those super testers are and then working with them. Um, it's kind of amazing the people that just are, get interested in this and they will take kits to all of their neighbors. They go out to their community and you just don't know who those people are going to be. But then when you find them, you want to try to, you know, um, support that as much as you can because they can really make a program successful. Um, so there are a lot of variables that go into wells and water quality and whatnot for the usefulness to be able to actually get something from that data. Yeah. I'm wondering what did you ask of these people regarding their well? Like did you ask the depth of the well and things yeah, like that? We ask well depth and I don't have that data plotted yet or kind of inserted here, but we do ask well depth. A lot of people don't know or they don't answer that question. Um, so we've experimented with should we give them ranges? Should be right now it just says do you know the depth of your well or what is the depth of your well? Because partially I feel like if we give them ranges, I think it makes it a lot easier for people to just like guess or just circle something. Whereas if it's a blank, they're not going to write something down if you don't really kind of know what it is. So we do ask about well depth. We've asked about flooding. We added that in 2019 if their well was impacted by flooding. Um, and then we obviously have the location information. So we ask for the lat long of the sampling point. Um, that's about all that we ask for right now. And then I have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so you had said that it looks like an apparent effect of the flooding in that data. Mm -hmm. Do you know if the NRDs that are in those areas, if they reported anything like that as well to sort of corroborate that? Yeah, I don't know yet because we just kind of started looking at our 2019 data, but that's definitely our next step is to see if that's corroborated at all. Um, and it may not be, but it seems like a plausible working hypothesis. So. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dan. Shannon, there's you know, there's, a, there's a couple of other benefits here that I think that's important to highlight. Obviously, having more data to work with as an engineer is very useful, but also when you go out there and work with these, these individuals, it makes them aware of hydrology, water resources, water quality, so it brings, you know, that to the, to the to the forefront. The other thing is, is as a University of Nebraska employee, when you're working out state, especially in central and western Nebraska, mm -hmm. you know, that brings a lot of prestige to the university, lets those people understand that we're interested in, in their conditions. So there's another a couple other benefits there that aren't as direct, but they're also very critical. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, John. And that is um, something that's really important. So in the, especially in 2019, we Initially, we kind of wanted to start with like 20 Eastern Nebraska counties, mostly just so we could feel like we could respond to them well and not, you know, say we're going to do a program and then have something not work well. But we got contacted by a lot of people um, who had flooding impacts like in central Nebraska, and we definitely responded and, and wanted them to participate in the program, even though they were kind of outside of our initial um, study design for that reason, right? because it is giving good people, inf giving people good information. It's, you know, teaching them something about water quality. When they get all the results back, they see themselves, they see, you know, the data that surrounds them. So it has great educational benefit as well. Hi, uh, the graph that you showed with the, um, I guess the QAQC of the spiked samples. Yeah. Of the experienced, inexperienced and the expert. Mm -hmm. Do you have, uh, an approach to improve the results from the experience? Yeah, so that's something that I would really like to follow on and do. So, you know, what it takes, at least in our definition, for someone to move from here to here is probably just doing this once or twice. <laughs> you know, because some of the people in this experience group just had done, um, 
either, you know, had taken a lab class, done, had a little exposure to some types of, of water quality testing or lab testing. So I think what this tells us is we need to, though, verify that the training programs we have in place are actually helping. So I'd like to go back. Um, what it would be nice to do is go back and start with people who are inexperienced, have them test, have them go through our training program, and then redo that first group and see if the accuracy changes. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a question which is related to the to incentives for the people who are volunteering. Because mm -hmm. I know in open source software applications, people contribute a lot online. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a way they put people's names online such that you feel good for contributing to something. Yep. Is this something you can probably apply to this such that, especially during the winter period when people don't go out, maybe you find a way to an algorithm to probably rank people who go out more during those crazy periods and yeah. such that they keep moving up the ladder and... Yeah, we haven't um, incorporated that, but you definitely can do that. And I think that's an important part of volunteer management. So you can kind of, um, the gamification, right? So you can give badges or have a leaderboard. There's lots of different things that you can do to help motivate people that want to participate. Right now, we're not doing any of that, but I think that can be really important because people do respond to that. I mean, we all respond to it. It's like, oh, I can, you know, if I do these three things, I can get this badge, you know? So um, there's kind of that you want to collect things or you want to compete or it, it kind of makes it more fun, maybe makes it like a game. And so, yeah, that's a, something we haven't explored, but I've seen it in other citizen science programs and I think it can be an important part of the continuity of, of managing your volunteers. Anyone else? For the people who reported um, unsafe water that they're potentially drinking, mm -hmm. were they concerned? Did they get in touch with you and ask what, what to do about it? Yeah, and I didn't express it, uh, talk about this, but actually we had, for this particular program, in um, we had two tiers of testing. So all of those individuals whose water tested above 10 milligrams per liter, we offered to come back out and do analytical testing. Um, so we would go back out and collect the sample. They obviously had to agree because they need, needed to like let us in, you know, to collect the samples. But we went out, collected samples, and then uh, gave them results back from an analytical lab on both nitrate and E. coli total coforms because we did not either want people to be, um, if they had overestimated and their water was fine, we didn't want them to um, put in a big treatment, you know, system that the expensive system they may not need. Conversely, if they were, um, you know, reporting 10, but maybe it was 20 or something higher, we also wanted to make sure there that they had good information. Uh, we also developed, we couldn't, uh, we didn't have the money to support, like, actually putting the treatment in place, but we also developed some data sheets around health impacts of elevated nitrate and also treatment options so that when, if they this information did lead them to install some kind of home treatment system that they would have some information about what the different treatment options and terminology and things like that at least meant. So we did have that follow-up. Um, and I think that's really important also because again, you don't want it to uh, just create fear or uncertainty. And so we, for the private well samples, it was really important that we close that loop and offer the follow-up testing. All right, well, let's thank Shannon for this presentation.